Amen. Joshua chapter 14. So Joshua chapter 14 is a short chapter in the Bible, but it's a chapter that's about one of my favorite characters in the entire Bible. I just love this guy. It's a, it's, it talks a lot about this man called Caleb in the Bible. Caleb actually reminds me a lot of my grandfather that, uh, that, I, that I grew up with. And uh, actually, he was Garrett's great-grandfather. And it was kind of interesting that Garrett got to, he got to know as his great-grandfather. He worked um, side by side with him for many years on the farm. But anyway, Caleb kind of reminds, my grandfather talks like Caleb talks. You know, and, and I'll get into that a little bit um, into, the, into the sermon. But basically, let's start in verse number one. And we're going to talk about Caleb this evening and things we can learn um, from the life of Caleb. Look at verse number one of Joshua chapter 14. And these are the countries with the children of Israel inherited to the land of Canaan. Eliezer the priest, Joshua the son of Nun, the heads of the fathers, the tribes of the children of Israel distributed for inheritance to them. And the next couple of verses talk about the two tribes that we talked about in Joshua chapter 13 and the half tribe. Uh, the two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, therefore they gave no part to the Levites in the land. On the other side of Jordan, we're talking, we talked about that in Judges, cha Judges, Joshua chapter 13, on the uh, two tribes and the half tribe on the other side of Jordan. We talked about that last week. But then in verse number five, it says, And as the Lord commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did, and they divided the land. In verse number six, Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land and brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Turn to Numbers chapter 13. So Caleb is saying here, 40 years, when I was 40, and we'll find out how old he is now in a, in a few verses, but he's saying, I was 40 years old when I went to espy out the land. So Caleb here is saying, I was one of the spies. He was one of the 12 spies, if you remember. Look at Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. If you remember, in the days of Moses, Moses sent 12 spies into the promised land to see what was going on, what was, what was on the other side of the river. What are we dealing with here? Look at Numbers chapter 13 and verse number 25. The Bible says, And they returned from searching the land after 40 days. This is the spies. The 12 spies came back. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness, wilderness of Paran and to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, saying, told Moses, saying, and said, We came unto the land whither thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. They're saying they came back and they, they have all the fruit and the, the produce. And they're saying the land is rich. The land is, is good land. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Now, who are the children of Anak? These are the giants, if we remember. Look at verse number 29. The Amicalites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. So these spies come back, and the report is this. The report is that it's great land. It's, it's beautiful land. I remember you can read stories about like the pioneers settling the West. And you know, there's a reason so many people died trying to get to California, because they got here and the land was the land was great and it was beautiful and the weather was, you know, the growing season was pretty much all the time. The land was very fruitful. That's what it means when it says a land of milk and honey, that the land is very fruitful. So that's what they say at first. But then they say it all turns bad in verse 28. <coughs> Excuse me, when they say, nevertheless, the people are strong. So they say that the people are just these, these big people and they're powerful, they're giants. The walls of the cities are very strong. But then look at verse number 30. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses. Now I have that underlined in my Bible. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. I've always been very fond of Caleb in the Bible. I'm going to explain to you why tonight. But the first thing, the first thing I want to point out is it was Caleb first that defended Moses. It was Caleb first that stood up and said, no, 
He said, he stilled the people because these, these, ten, these other spies are saying, look, they're just too strong for us, and they're giving this bad report about how we'll never be able to take over this land, and all the people are getting stirred up. And Caleb comes in and he says, no, 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 no. And he defends Moses and ultimately defends the Lord is what you'll see. Now that is huge, that he was the first one to just step up. Turn to Proverbs chapter 18. Turn to Proverbs chapter 18 and verse number 24. That is huge to me. I, that just pops out at me in the Bible. Look at Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 24. Now I've preached on the first part of this verse, but I've never really preached. You know, with Proverbs, there's usually two parts of the verse, and there's sermons on both parts of the verse in Proverbs. That's how deep the Bible is. Look at Proverbs 18, 24. The Bible says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. This was Caleb at this moment. So, I mean, just a kind of a sidetrack from the sermon here. Here's how to know who your friends are in your life. You don't know how your friends are. Look, it's easy to have friends when everything's, are, when everything's just great. Everybody wants to be your friend. When, when they, you know, your economy's great and maybe you have good jobs. Look, this is where celebrities and, like, ultra-rich people, like, go wrong right here. They think, like, oh, everybody's my friend. It's like, no, those people aren't your friends. They're hanging around you because you have a nice, huge yacht or, you know, a, a skyscraper or whatever, right? I mean, everybody wants to hang out and be your friend when you're on top. But it's when there's a fight, when there's tough times, that's when you know, that's when you know who your friends are. And that's what Caleb proved here. Look, that's when, when there's a fight, when there's tough times, that's when you find out who's who in your life. Now, I normally wouldn't tell a story like this, but I'm going to tell this story. I was a freshman in high school. I had a moment like this, a secular moment like this. I was a freshman in college, I'm sorry. I was about 19 years old, and we were traveling to visit some friends in, like, a bigger city. I mean, we're all, like, hick kids from, a, you know, from the nearest town is 50 people. So we went to this town. There was, like, 20,000 people in this town. It was Grand Forks, North Dakota, huge city, okay, 20,000 people. So we went and we traveled to this. It was me and two other friends and we drove to this town. We were going to visit um, some other friends of ours and we were going to go to their apartment and visit these guys for the weekend. And we, we drove into this, this town and we were on like Main Street and I'm telling you, we were, not, we were just driving to this, this place. And this car full of guys like just started like tailgating us and pulling in front of us. To this day, I don't know what it was about. To this day. And you have to understand, like, here's another thing. You Fresno people are not going to understand this story because you're like, oh, man, people are going to get shot and killed here. But you, that one thing you have to understand about North Dakota, especially in the late 90s, is, you know, when there's an argument, you know, you just fling the fists and then things are over with. That's how things worked. But anyway, this car is cutting us off, and these guys are hanging out the window, and I'm just, I'm telling my friends, I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but it's like, we're going to be fighting here soon. You know, I'm like, just drive. I'm like, I'm sitting in the back seat. And I'm like, just drive to um, our friend's apartment. And it's like, we're just going to get out. Because we're, we're trying to get away from these guys, and it's not working. Then we don't know these guys. We're like, just drive to the apartment. We'll just get out, and we'll just, we'll just work it out. That's what we're going to have to do. <laughs> you know? And uh, so it's me and two friends. One friend's driving. One friend's in the passenger seat. I'm in the back seat. We pull up to the apartment. This other car pulls up right next to us. These guys pile out. I think there was three guys there, too. And me and the friend in the passenger seat, we just go to work on the situation. And the other friend just runs into the apartment. <laughs> he just runs right in. And to, for years and years and years, I was just like, man, what in the world? You know, we're like, we're just getting jumped by all these guys and you run away? You know, what is wrong with you? You know, but anyway, look, here's the thing. My other buddy was like this small, skinny guy, and he just jumped right out, and we just, you know, we went after it. You know, that's what you do. So, and, it, you know, it worked out. You know, I was, uh, I was able to handle myself, you know, when I was, when I was a kid. But anyway, um, that's how you find out who's with you, is what I'm trying to say. That's why, like, soldiers that have been to war together, man, they'll have a tight bond. Because they've been in, like, they've been in the heat of it, and they know, they know if they've been in a situation like that, they know who their friends are. They know that, man, we were like, people were trying to kill us, and, you know, this guy didn't run away. This guy helped me. That's how you know who your friends are. You know, and if you've never been in a tight spot, or you've never been in a situation like that, I, can you really tell? I guess probably not. 
You know, but here's the thing, you know, at this church, in this ministry, in this life that we're living, we're going to have spiritual battles. We're going to have spiritual battles that we're going to fight, and we're going to fight these battles together, is the idea. And guess what? We're going to find out who's who. We're going to find out who's who. Think about Caleb here. Think about Caleb here. The other ten were against the two. It was two against ten. And he's the first one to stand up and just still the people. Look, their loyalty to Moses and the Lord depended, it did not depend on how they felt that day. That, that's where the, the other ten were. It just depended, their loyalty to Moses completely depended on like, their feelings, on how they, how they felt. You know, these people are big. That scares me. They turned on Moses. Turn to verse number 31. Turn up. Look, they're a ruined people. Look at Numbers 13, 31. These other ten were a ruined people. But the men that went up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Well, I mean, that's, you know, the irony of that verse is it's true that those men were stronger than these ten spies because these ten spies were weak. And at least, look, at least they knew they were weak. Look at verse 32. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched under the children of Israel. That means a bad report, saying the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are great men, of men of great stature. And there we saw giants. So they just keep laying on the, the negativity, and we can't do this. The giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and they were in their, we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Turn to Numbers chapter 14. Turn to Numbers chapter 14. And look what the Lord says here. In Numbers chapter 14, look at verse number 24. But Caleb had a different spirit. Caleb had a different spirit. That's why he stood up um, for Moses and for the Lord. Look at verse number 24 of Numbers chapter 14. The Bible says, But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land wherein he went, and his seed shall possess it. That's what Caleb was talking about in, in Joshua chapter 14. Go back there. So Joshua was saying, look, we're talking about like what land everybody gets to possess in Joshua 13, 14, 15, 16, and on. And Joshua here is saying, look, I was told that, you know, back when I did this, he's like, I was going to possess this land. And look at Joshua 14 and verse number 8. Because he said, I went to spy out the land, and he's telling the story in verse number 8. And remember what Numbers, 24, Numbers 14, 24 said. The Bible says, because he had another spirit with him and followed me fully, the Lord said. Well, look what Caleb, he remembers this. In verse number 8, he says, Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me, the other ten, with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. He's like, I was fully on board with the Lord. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance, and thy child's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. But Moses knew it. I mean, Moses knew what happened there. Look at verse 10. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he had said these forty and five years, even since the Lord spake his word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. He's eighty-five. Score, fourscore is four times twenty. And five, he's 85 years old right now. And look what he says in verse 11. And yet I am as strong this day as it was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. He's not just saying, look, I'm just strong like morally or I'm just strong spiritually. He's saying, look, I'm strong. <laughs> he's like, I can still fight. And he does. He says, now therefore give me this mountain. Wherever the Lord spake in that day, for thou heardest in that day how the Anakims that were there, and the cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord with me, then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord had said. Caleb, he not only comes back and defends Moses, 40 years before this, he defends Moses saying, we can beat these people. He goes and he literally beats them when he's 85 years old. 40, I mean, how do you not like this guy? Turn to Joshua 15. Joshua chapter 15. And we see kind of how it, his, uh, his inheritance 
um, continues here in Joshua 15, look at verse number 12. And the west border was to the great sea and the coast thereof. This is the coast of the children of Judah, round about according to their families. And unto Caleb, the son of Jethunah, he gave part among the children of Judah according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, even the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which, is, which city is Hebron. And Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak, Shishai, Ahim, Ahiman, and Talmai, the children of Anak. He went and he beat him when he was 85. <laughs> I mean, uh, go back to verse number, or chapter number 14. Go back to chapter number 14. In verse number 13, it, it, the chapter finishes, it says, And Joshua blessed him, and gave unto Caleb, the son of Jethun, a Hebron for an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jeth Jephunah, the Kenizzite to this day, because he hath wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron before was Kirjath Bara, which Arba was a great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest from war. So we kind of see the full story where Caleb completes the conquest and basically completes the prophecy that he was to get this land that he, he walked on. Basically the land he walked on as a spy is what he inherited, the Bible says. So the application tonight I want to make is, you know, just the strength of Caleb. You know, the first thing that we saw was just the spiritual strength of Caleb. How he just, and that really is where like all his other strength came from. Because how many times did the Bible just, did I read to you, that Caleb followed the Lord fully? Caleb followed the Lord fully. And in Numbers 14, 24, the Bible says, because he had another spirit with him. His, his spirit was with the Lord. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3. Amen. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3. So, I mean, there can be a spirit that's against the Lord. You know, there can be a spirit that works against the Lord. And Caleb did not have that spirit. That's why he stood up for Moses. That's why he followed the Lord fully. And that's why he ended up where he ended up in Joshua chapter 14. Proverbs 3, 5, the Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not under thine, thine own understanding. This is exactly what Caleb did. All the other ten spies, they just leaned on their own understanding. They just looked at the huge people. They looked at the many people. They looked at the powerful people. They looked at the walled cities. And they said, we can't beat these people. That was not Caleb. He just, he just trusted in the Lord with all his heart. That's what he did. Look at Matthew 22 and verse 37. Nothing happened around him. Think of this spiritual strength, folks. Nothing could happen around Caleb. No, no situation could pop up around him that would affect his spiritual strength. And what does that spiritual strength cause him to do? To wholly trust in the Lord. That's it. Jesus said unto him, verse 37 of Matthew 22, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and with all thy mind. Do you do this? Or do you worry about what other people are going to think if you follow the Lord with all your heart and all your mind and, and you just have a, a different spirit than everybody else? This is exactly what the spies did. We, like, we can't defeat these people. Think about the spies. We can't defeat these people. Just a few years earlier, it was just a, a few years earlier, God had parted the Red Sea. All those spies saw that. All those spies walked across that dry land. The Lord was literally feeding them every single day miraculously. <laughs> Yet they still, he could, they still couldn't fully lean on the Lord. Look, I mean, think about this. It should be easier for us to fully lean on the Lord. I mean, you say, how? Because look, think about this. Everything that those ten spies saw as they went into the uh, promised land was, was kind of bad, right? I mean, everything that they saw was against their, uh, their, their reasoning that they could beat these people. But I mean, think about us. Think about us. What do we see today? What do you see when you go out in the world today? Do you see a bunch of things that you feel like following in the world today? I can't, you know, sometimes I wonder why any Bible-believing Christian would choose to do anything that the non-Christians are doing today. I mean, you can see the consequences all around us. You can see the consequences, you can see, I mean, just the mess that is all around us from all the non-Christians. Look, these are not a powerful people out here. You know, I've never really, I've never really talked to my kids much about about like drugs and alcohol. I mean, confession. I've never really talked to my kids, about, especially drugs. I don't, I don't know that I've ever really had a conversation with my kids like, hey, don't use heroin. I, I mean, I don't think I've ever really, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, that's not a powerful person. 
You know, that's, it's, it's, it's kind of an ob Others kind of give me an object lesson. I don't have to say a word. We're not seeing a bunch of giants out there. You know, we're seeing a bunch of weak zombies out there. We're seeing, you know, it's self-explanatory. We're seeing a bunch of people that have ruined their lives with these things. So I don't understand why, like, a non-Christian would want to do those things. I, you know, it's, it's confusing to me. It's something that I haven't even really had to teach my kids, to be honest. I mean, but that's how it is really when you think about it. That's how it is really with everything in our lives. When you think about it, I mean, don't you see the same thing? Don't you see the same thing with like public school? Do you look at public school and be like, that's powerful. That's a powerful system. Look at the mighty walls on that system. I, I, I was, there's school must be in session like summer school or something because when I drive to work, there, you know, when I come home for lunch, the kids are walking across the street. I did the math on it the other day. It was like 20% of the kids walking across the street had like blue or green or pink hair or something. You know, just like, and I'm not saying like that makes you a horrible person, but I'm just saying it doesn't look like it's heading in a good direction, you know? But I mean, just life in general, people's kids outside the Christian life, outside the Bible, it, it's not something that I look at and say, these are powerful people. We, we, we need to be like that. So, I mean, the spies, you know, at least they, they had some logic. I mean, they were not trusting in the Lord. They were trusting in themselves. But look, what we see is actually the opposite of what the, the spies saw, in, in my, which demonstrates, by the way, the spiritual strength of Caleb, because he didn't care. He didn't care. You know, the, the, the equivalent would be going out and just seeing that everybody else outside, we were just, you know, having a hard time in this church, and we were under persecution, which has been that way for Christians, by the way throughout history, and then everybody else outside in the world who's not in, in the Christian life and the Bible-believing life is just having a great time and having a great life. Look, that's not the case that I see, but even if that was the case, Caleb still would have been like, no, I will fully follow the Lord. That demonstrates the spiritual strength of Caleb. It, it made no difference to what was happening around him, to what he did in his life. He just, you know what? He just did he just did what he knew he was supposed to do, which was trust on the Lord with all his heart and all his mind. Caleb had great strength of character, too. You say, what is strength of character? Strength of character is doing what's right no matter what. Following the truth, no matter the benefit or the detriment to you personally, that is strength of character. Just saying, just saying, this is right, I will stand for this, no matter what. What, at what cost to me? Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. This is the right thing. I will do this no matter what the cost is to me. Amen. And here's the thing. Remember, it was two against ten. Imagine the, imagine the walk back. Imagine the walk back when they're listening. When they're listening to all the ten. This is terrible. There's no way we can defeat these people. And here's the thing. Men. There's too many weak men. There's too many weak men. Here's the thing, men. All you have to do to fail is nothing. All Caleb would have had to do is say nothing. All you have to do to fail in this Christian life is to say nothing. And you guess what? Your family will suffer. Imagine if they just would have said nothing. Turn to Numbers 14 again. I mean, look, I mean, part of what the people were saying was true. The people were huge. The people were big. But the bottom line is Caleb and Joshua needed to actually take action against the other ten. The defense is not going to cut it in this Christian life. If they would have been silent and they would have done, done nothing, this is what would have happened. Look at Numbers 14 and verse 37. Even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. The Lord killed them. The Lord judged the people, but those ten spies were killed. So, saying nothing would have cost them their lives. Joshua and Caleb. So, see, the thing is, the thing is in this Christian life that you have to understand is that you men, you have pressure being put on you. You have pressure being put on you all the time. And all you have to do is just, you know, do nothing, and that pressure is going to push you down. 
Doing nothing is not going to cut it. You have to put pressure back. Look, Satan actively attacks. Satan's not playing a defensive game. He's pushing. He's looking for cracks. And he's driving wedges in cracks. Look, it's the same for me, by the way. Satan puts pressure on me. Satan looks for cracks. And, I mean, those cracks are, you know, they, they, you know they, that's my family. They're looking for weak points. Satan's looking for weak points all the times. Look, every single time, let me give you a little testimony here. Every single time that there's been a big thing in the last two and a half years, we've seen active attacks from Satan. I'm, tell I'm telling you, from my perspective and my family, when, when uh, we were getting ready to come here to plant the satellite church, big time attacks from Satan. I I'm not going to get into the details of it, but man, it it's real. Big time attacks from Satan. We're getting ready to, we're getting ready to uh, start the church. Big time attacks. From Satan. We're getting ready to we're getting ready to launch the homeschool group. Huge attacks from Satan. I mean, look, you, I could just go on and on, but like this is real stuff. This is real stuff, and you have to put pressure. Look, men are too weak. These ten spies, there was ten families without fathers. They were all killed. They were left without fathers. And look, it's really the families that suffer when the men fail to lead. Right. Right. So you must do it. It takes intervention. And look, here's the thing. I can't intervene for you. I can't follow you home. I don't want to follow you home. I'm not going to follow you home. I've said a million times I would never want to follow you home. You have to do it yourself. You've got to stand up. You need to be men. You need to be men for your families. I mean, look, I mean look, look to your left and your right and look at your kids. That's why you need to be men. Turn to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. Turn to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, look at verse number 22. This is the famous story where Jesus casts out a demon and and it's, it's really a funny story when you look at it. And it shows you, shows you I mean, I know Jesus is intelligent because he's God. I mean, obviously, he's, I mean, it's, it seems silly to even say that Jesus is intelligent. But there's some real intelligence here. You look at this in verse number 22. The scribes that came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils cast us he out devils. So first of all, just look at that statement right there. Look at the statement that these so-called scribes and Pharisees just said to Jesus. The next few verses are him just basically calling them morons. It's funny because, like, you know, lots of doctrine and stuff comes out of this. Like, oh, the, I mean, so many people are like, you know, how do you know if you're going to heaven? Oh, as long as I don't commit the unpardonable sin, you know, and they're all weirded out by like this and they've turned it into something weird. But I mean, it's really like just an intellectual just beat down by Jesus right here. Because think about what they said. They're like, he, he's, he has Satan and he's casting out Satan with Satan. I mean, that's dumb. <laughs> You know, he's just, but Jesus doesn't just say, that's dumb. Here's what he says. And he called them unto him and said in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? He's like, what? What in the world? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan riseth up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. No man can enter into, and what I'm really going to focus on is verse number 27, no man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he'll spoil his house. So Jesus is just like trying to explain like basic logic to these guys, like, you know, Satan, casting out Satan. Think about what you just said. <laughs> you know? And then it goes into, you know, um, the unforgivable sin and all, all that. But basically what Jesus is saying here, he's like, look, to cast out, to cast out, Satan, I had to bind, to cast out the demon, I had to bind Satan. That's what he's saying. I had to, I had to, he's like, I, I bound Satan. I am not Satan. I bound him. It's like I had to bind up the strong man. But think about this. To spoil a kingdom, it makes perfect sense. To spoil a kingdom, you've got to bind the king. You've got to capture the king. To spoil a house, you've got you to bind the man protecting it. Right? Look. So you need to be the strong man 
of that house. Look, most men, most men bind themselves. Most men bind themselves like we're, we're way too adverse to confrontation in this country today. We're way too adverse to convert confrontation today. Look, sometimes you just got to be confrontational. Sometimes you just got to take care of stuff. Look, some, some things, I mean, like I said, look to your left and your right. If you don't take care of stuff, that's the price. These kids are depending on you to be that strong man. You know, I mean, like, you know, people, look, people that, uh, that, who's the strong man in this church? It's Jesus. That's the strong man. Can, can they bind Jesus? Can anybody bind Jesus? They can't bind Jesus. So who are they coming after? Next in line. They're coming after me. So, I mean, look, it's not really a, a surprise. It's not really a surprise that, like, a, a pastor would get attacked. That's not really a, a big shocker. You know, but look, I mean, I need to be a strong man to protect this church. Just as you need to be a strong man to protect your house. That's what Jesus is talking about. That's what Jesus, that's, that's what he's saying. Young ladies, like, look, look, ladies, you above 10, raise your hand. Ladies above 10, raise your hand right now. Single ladies above 10. I, I miscalculated that one. <laughs> look, ladies above 10, listen up. You need to tell yourself, you need to remember the story of Caleb in your life. Because ladies above 10, if you marry somebody that is weak, you will ruin your life. If you marry someone, like, I mean, there's situations where maybe we can, maybe we can take somebody that's 30 or 35 and, and we'll talk about that Sunday morning and, and maybe we can help that situation. But here's the real thing we want to do. We want to get these kids on the right track. Ladies, if you marry a weak man, you will ruin your entire life on this earth. Turn to Joshua 14.10. Caleb, I mean, you say, well, wait, what do you mean, what kind of strong? Well, Caleb was also physically strong. You shouldn't marry some wimp either. And now behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, on this day, fourscore and five years old. I'm 85 years old, and I'm as strong this day as I was in that day that Moses sent me. He's like, I'm 85 years old. I moved next to my grandpa before I took over the farm and we lived a couple miles away. And I'm like, I'm going to get to help him with stuff. I'm going to get to go out and help the old man put up fences. And I'm going to get to help the old man do this. And he'd call me right after he got done working on something. And he's 90 years old and he'd say, I put in all these fence posts with this sledgehammer. What do you think of that? And I'm like, he's like, now let's go have some sandwiches. You know, <laughs> like, call, me, call me before next time. You never would. You know, I didn't even really help him that much. Because he wouldn't, he's just like, he was just like Caleb. He's like, what could I have done? I'm 90. Ah! <laughs> Use it or lose it, folks. That's how it works when you get older. But look, he was spiritually strong too. You need ladies, back, we're still on the ladies. You need somebody physically strong. No skinny jeans. No little wimpy California man or whatever that I'm seeing down here or over here. You need somebody that's spiritually strong too, though. You need somebody that's got some strength of character. And look, here's the thing, ladies. I get it. I get it, ladies. They're rare. All right? But here's the, here's the, here's the thing. Because they're so rare, because they're so rare, they're easy to spot. All right? They're so rare, they're really easy to spot. You don't see a lot of them today, especially the younger ones. But look, here's the thing. Here's all you have to do, ladies. All you have to do is remember this. No weaklings. Spiritually strong, strength of character, Caleb, Caleb, Caleb. Just keep thinking that to yourself. And then you follow the Lord fully, and He will provide. He will provide. And look, this church, this church, this church, which, by the way, belongs to the Lord, and He is the strong man here. I'm just deputy. He's the strong man. Look, this church will filter them out for you. A proper church. You see, see how important this is? See how important this is that we just defend this thing to the last man? Because this church will filter them out for you. And there, I'm not going to preach Sunday morning sermon right now. And Sunday morning sermon was written a year ago. Just remember that when you hear it Sunday morning. The attacks will come. The attacks, ladies, the attacks will come on your family. 
You're like, I, you know, maybe if you're 14 or 15 or 16 or I don't know when these things happen, as a young lady, you start to think maybe I want children and what your children will be like someday and you get to be, and you just think about having a family and think about getting married. But here's the thing, your family, that perfect unit that you envision in your mind is going to need to be defended. And you can't have some weakling or it will all go bad. Remember, it was two verses 10 and Caleb did not care. But the thing is, we all need to be strong. We all need to be strong. The attacks will come. Just be strong and just do what the Bible says, you know, and have that strong spirit. Look, that, that, is, uh, that is character. That is character. And I don't know, you know, I don't know how to, um, this is so important that we raise our kids right. It's so important that you instill this strength in your kids. And that's another thing, you know, just like we talked about last Sunday night, you, you want to raise these little boys, you can't raise them to be weaklings. You say, oh, I'm a big, tough, strong guy. You know how many big, tough, strong guys I know that have raised wimps? Just because they wanted to remove every obstacle. They wanted everything to be easy. They wanted everything to just be out of the way for their kids and all this kind of stuff, you know. And look, you're going to raise a bunch of wimps. And then your little wimp is going to ruin somebody's life. I mean, it doesn't seem serious when they're five or six or seven or eight or nine years old. But you end up with a 30-year-old lazy wimp. And, and now you've got wrecked lives. I mean, it gets, it gets serious. So look, we need... Men, we need strength, and women, ladies, young ladies, you need, and listen, young ladies, you listen to your dad. You listen to your dad because it's your dad's job to root out wimps. I will work in conjunction with your dad to root out weaklings. And then when you find some weakling and you're like, oh, he's a cute weakling, your dad's gonna say no. And your pastor is going to say, listen to your dad. Amen. And that, that, I mean, that is the beauty of a biblical church. And we have to follow what, and look, it's so, it's so easy. It's so easy. It's so easy. We just follow the Bible no matter what. You know, emotions get involved and, you know, you get emotional about things and, you know, it's like, oh, man, can't believe that. But we just follow the Bible no matter what. Because what do we know? Nothing. We know nothing. We follow the Bible no matter what. We need strength. And this church, look, this church going forward is going to need strong men. We have strong men in here. We need strong men to raise strong sons and smart daughters to listen to those strong men who are their dads. And this is what this church will do for you. This is how it all works together. And, and all I have to do, my job is relatively easy. I just get up here and I just can't worry about, I just can't worry about, you know, I just do what the Bible says. That's it. That's it. Because when I start being like, well, maybe we can, you know, not do it this way because of this and whatever. And every situation is unique. I'm learning that too. We just do what the Bible says. That's it. So Caleb was a great example in the Bible of just, just strength. Physical strength, strength of spirit, strength of character. It, it's just a great example. And like you, you young ladies, you just remember that. You men leading your families, you need to be the strong man. Or somebody's going to spoil your house. And it's, it's going to happen. And all it takes is for you to do nothing. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father.